Now today is September 9th, 2020, and we're here doing an interview with you. Um, so what, when were you born and, and in what city were you I'm born? born um, oh, this is, a, this is a joke I usually tell people. You know, when you're raised in an orphanage, you don't know where you were really born. So I'll say, oh, I found out where I was born. And they'll go, the girls go, yeah, where? Says, in a park. They go, in a park? I said, yeah, Menlo Park. And then I found out later that I was really born in Palo Alto. So that was the end of my joke. <laughs> oh, so okay. Sometimes I tell people that. Yeah. Yeah. How did you find out that? And then, what? How did you Go find ahead. out that you were born in Palo Alto? I give, I finally, did my birth certificate. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Finally, I found that out as an adult. So, so I all through life I was just tell people I was born born in a park, just for the heck of it, <laughs> for the fun of it. I guess you can do things like that when you're an orphan. Yeah. That's the advantage of being an orphan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I understand that you uh, spent maybe the first few years of your life in San Francisco, though? Oh, yeah. San Francisco, Chinatown. I didn't realize that too a lot later on in life, too, because you don't know much about your background. Because the teachers never really told us anything. Everything was to protect the children at Mingguang because of the reputation back in those days of prostitution. And so that's what's going on right now with Uplift. The, a group of the MQ girls are trying to get set the record straight that prostitution was way before our time. So, um, but it's just more exciting for the press to write things about prostitution. So, mm. Ming Guang got, so the girls from the Ming Guang home now, the learned ones, that means the person that's in charge has a PhD, so she knows how to handle things better than us girls. That um, my education in life was life itself. That's how I got to start running a store, just because it became about that's the way it was with my life. I see. Um, and so did you find out um, more about your mom from the people who are running the orphanage then? Mom, no, really from my, from my half-sister. That's right. didn't go to the home because she was always threatened with, you don't want to go to the home because they're mean to you and they're strict and everything. So that was kind of the reputation, very strict. Mm -hmm. And so she had to stay at the farm and actually she had a worse life because she was a slave to her relatives because grandma wasn't very nice. Our grandma. I see. Um, so how did, how did you meet your half sister? She would come to the home to visit. It's all, it's all in my book. Um, here it is. Yep. Yep. I got one too. <laughs> yeah. I'm oh, yeah, still so Yours is the original one. You know how much that's worth? It was worth about over $1,000 on, on Amazon or Facebook. Or oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so, and if it's signed, it's even worse. It's worth more. Mm. This is the, like the second edition. And actually, it won an award for um, humanitarianism. Um, there's a picture of me, once upon a time picture. <laughs> and this is way before my time. That's me. Mm. Wow. Um, and so Can do I you, oh, sure, sorry. go ahead, Daniel. Can I ask what um, inspired you to write the book? Uh, my husband, he, he was a social worker and he thought my story was just something to share. And I go, who would want to read the book? And then a friend that teaches Asian studies, he encouraged me also. So that's how it came about. And uh, well, no, this is at universities, at some universities. Okay. And this is your first one, right? I understand you have about yeah, three more. No. Okay. That, that cover was done by my nephew. Oh. That's, um, 
So does it say Ming Kwong here? Done by China Books. Hmm. Does it say Ming Kwong in Chinese? Yeah, that says Ming Kwong. And then you can barely see it on this one. It says Ming Kwong also, because I wanted to get Ming Kwong in there. Hmm. There. <laughs> we might have a uh, we might have a second edition copy at the library too. Yeah, yeah I know, I know that we have a few. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, how many years did you live um, in Los Gatos in the Ming Kwong home? Oh, uh, Los Gatos was about two to about maybe thirteen years of age. Then I transferred up to the Oakland home, closer to Oakland Chinatown, which was supposed to be better for us. So we get some kind of education about our background. Gotcha. Um, but it was, uh, you know, like a, not a very good experience because from quiet Las Gatos to living on the corner of a busy street was pretty chaotic. Hmm. I see. Um, and so when you were in Los Gatos, then you, did you go to the, uh, the grammar school on University Avenue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was University Avenue. M imagine it was. I think I'm that's sure what, what it was, yeah. I'm not sure what street it was, mm -hmm. but it was the old Spanish building mm -hmm. where they have some restaurants now, or they did have restaurants. Yes, that's right. Um, so what was your, your experience like going to school like there? Bingo. bingo was something else too. She's the one that made the most money in, of all the girls. <laughs> her, she's famous for her paintings, and they sell for thousands of dollars. Wow. And she was at the Young Museum and so forth. That's what, Bingo. What's her name? Bingo. Bernice Bing. And uh, my book, 10,000 Flowers, mm -hmm. I've written four books, actually. And so 10,000 Flowers, there's a, a good chapter of, about Bingo. Oh, okay. And let me see. She painted this picture there. It's Lolita, her sister. She painted that, but oh. it wasn't for sale um, because she copied it from a book, but it reminded her of her sister Lolita, so that's why it's mm. it's on the wall. And then under each one, I have a haiku. Oh, when did you I get... Write haikus. When did you start writing haikus? Um... When I met Jerry, which was about 15, 20 years ago. Oh, yeah, it's in my first book, The Haiku started about that time. And so be before that time, actually, so I did all the traditional 575. Five. Now I'm into the more of the modern haiku, where it doesn't have to have all the exact um, syllables. Mm -hmm. You call that modern. Modern haiku. Hmm, I see. Um, just to Daniel say something. <laughs> Hi, Daniel. <laughs> I, um, I did have a question. I was wondering um, how you, as you moved between Autos and Oakland, were you still with um, the Ming Kwong home? Were they how, still how how I moved out of the Oakland home? Or between, so from Los Gatos to Oakland, how did they make that decision? Oh, each person's situation is different depending on the ba your background and if you have relatives that say where you want to, where they might want you to go, they follow those rules too. So with me, I had nobody. So it was time for me to go. That's it. And from, from Oakland, you, um, you live there until you're about 16 and then you're too old for the system. So you're, you're out of it and you might be, they try to find you a home though, where you, you can live and do housework. They always ask you, do you want to be in a family? And by that time you're so independent, you don't want to be in a fa regular family. And so then you do housework so you make money every week, every month. So mm -hmm. that's where I ended up in. Palo Alto. I see. Because that's where I was born. <laughs> Not <laughs> in <Little> Park. <laughs> um, so you ended up doing housekeeping at a house in Palo Alto? Housework in Palo Alto for a, 
a family that had a, well, whatever, Palo Alto family. <laughs> Do you still? On University Avenue. Oh, gee, that's kind of funny how huh? I ended up on University Avenue. That is yeah. funny. Like, I guess University Avenue when I, where I went to school in Las Gatas. Was that University Avenue? It was, yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. That's uh, the old town. In the old town area, yeah. Yeah, Las Gatas, yeah. When you... Oh, it dawned on me, University Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you moved from university to university. Um, which, when you, when you were with that family, was it a generally good experience? Like, have you spoken with when them? When I was at the um, home in Palo Alto? Um, yes. Is that what you asked? Yes. So when you were at the home in Palo Alto, was it a good experience with the family? Well, at, when I was doing housework, yeah, it was good. Good enough. Because, Did you, um, did you live there? What? Did you live there? Yeah, oh yes, 24-7. Gotcha. Every time I put money in the bank, they put money in the bank for me. So when I got married, I was about $300, um, $300 more than my husband. So I would tell people he married me for my money. <laughs> um, was it a pretty good experience with them? Um, making yeah, money good with enough. Them? Yeah, because I wasn't treated like a, a maid. My sister lived in another home in Palo Alto, and she was treated like a maid. She had to eat out in the kitchen, and they would ring the bell for her when they wanted something. With me, I was sat there. I was with them at dinner time, so that was good. Around what years was that? Like, what years were you working in Palo Alto? Oh, when I was going to high school. Mm -hmm. Teen, I was a teenager. Right. So you said that you had to leave the <clears throat> leave the orphanage at age sixteen. Yeah, right? about uh, no the orphanage. Yeah, about that time. Uh, yeah, because I was a teenager living in in Palo Alto at that time. Yeah. Okay. And not um, far away was our the place where I was supposedly born on Parkinson Avenue in Palo Alto. So. Mm -hmm. It was kind of nice to be back in Palo Alto, even though from, see, first it's Los Gatos to Oakland, then Oakland to Palo Alto. So it was all kind of a cultural shock because it's so extremely different, each area. So I had to get used to Palo Alto again. Not again, but it's like being back in Los Gatos, but a little different because it was busy, busier. Right. Um, and, uh, so when you went to school, going back to Los Gatos, when you went to school in Los Gatos, do you remember a lot of the friends that you encountered there, um, or were you mostly friends with the Mingguang girls? Well, there are no Mingguang girls around. I'm the only one around, so I have to make new friends. So that, that was also a, a problem, but... I happened to meet a Kwong family, K-W-O-N-G, that lived just a half a block or so away from me. And so I would get rides to school from her or else I'd have to probably walk. So. How long was that walk? That way. So yeah. in case you people know the Kwong family, um, he's pretty well known. He's got the Zen Mountain Center in um what do you call it santa rosa and he's a, a zen master <laughs> oh so that's really different from uh you know it was because of my husband that he they became friends because he he was always enthusiastic about bill kwong but now he's a roshi r-o-s-h-i a zen master with people like he knows people like uh tit nan han and maybe Dalai Lama by now and all the other people that are in that other world. So it was interesting. My husband was more outgoing than I was. I was more the quiet one. How did you meet your husband? Through a party. Oh. An after college party. He went to college. I didn't go to college, but he asked me to dance. And so that's what, that's how it started. And he said to me, um, what would your parents say if um, 
I wanted to date you. Or I go, I don't have any parents. <laughs> so he was lucky. <laughs> Oh. So after after you left the Palo Alto family, uh, what did you do and where did you go? What did I do what? Or where did you go after Palo Alto? Oh, uh, let's see. I probably got married. I got married when I was 19. So where did I? Oh, I know. Yeah, that's right. I moved up to Oakland. Okay, so back to Oakland again. Oakland was um, and roomed with my sister and roomed with another girl named Rhoda. At okay. Near the light, near Lake Merritt, so that was nice. Mm -hmm. And what made you decide to go back to Oakland? Um, I don't know. Just because I'm, I'm more familiar with Oakland. Mm -hmm. And my half sister lived in Oakland near Chinatown, and the home's in Oakland, so you might go back there for Christmas time. That's when the girls gathered at Christmas time, so that was that was nice. I see. Um, and when you say the girls, you mean the Ming Kwong girls. girls? That means the MQ girls. Or yeah. I always call them girls, but they're really women. Right. Yeah. MQ girls, because that's what we called them at the home. Mm -hmm. um, there's probably about how many of them that you still keep in touch with? Maybe about 20 of them? What, what did you say? It's uh, hard to hear. You, you, you keep in touch with them still. Um, oh, yeah. And yeah. there's probably about 20 or 30 of them. Yeah, there's quite a few. But they're all, they're all kind of younger than me. Oh, I'm, okay. I guess how old I am. I'm 87, Jeepers. Wow. So I'm, I'm one of the oldest ones around. <laughs> almost everybody in my age group is past, has passed on. I or see. Sick or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm um, still here. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, and the Mick Kwong home was Presbyterian, was it? Um, Presbyterian. Occidental National Board of Missions, Presbyterians. Oh, this reminds me, this is Laura Birch. Laura Birch, do you, do you know Laura Birch? Well, she came down and talked to the Uplift people, which is now called Uplift Families First. But she came down when it was called Eastfield Ming Guang, and she contributed her artwork for the Ming Guang home. Oh. Also. And so, so that's one of her artworks on the sweatshirt? Yeah. Yeah, Laura Birch is around. In mm -hmm. fact, I still sell some of her goodies at the store. Not too many. Mm -hmm. A few purses, and I used to sell silk scarves and stuff of hers. She That's named good. an earring after me once. Uh, it was called Ming Guang for Nona. And I says, you really did? You named an earring after me? And, and I said, what does it look like? And she says, an Egyptian flower. And I says, I've never seen an Egyptian flower. And she says, neither have I. <laughs> just, we just have fun. That's awesome. She is a good, good woman. Daniel, did you have a Broken question? bones in her life. Oh, wow. Because she had this rare bone disease. I see. Well, they didn't expect her to live until she was about 40-something, but now she's passed away when she was 62. Oh, OK. Um, I was going to mention that she's a she's a famous artist, so that's uh, very cool. Can you talk louder, please. Sorry, I was mentioning that she was a famous artist, so that's very, it's very cool that you interacted with her. Yeah, she was she was really really nice. In fact, one time I was talking on the phone to her, and I said, "Let's just zoom in." <laughs> I use the word zoom. Let's just zoom in on some object, and then all of a sudden my phone felt really really hot. And I says, what's going on? I looked around the room and I thought, jeepers, what's weird. But on her end, everything was nice and cool, but not my end. That's because she was so powerful. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. She's the only woman that was like that, that had that power within her, at least with my friends. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting, though, that my, the phone got hot because we were zooming in? 
Yeah. Okay, let's try the phone now. <laughs> no, <it's kidding. laughs> I don't think it's going to be hot. <laughs> um, and so when did you, when did you start your store? Did you open that? Oh, that was out of necessity. Okay. My husband, who's very controversial, won a case against the, the oh, he had, um, this is such a long story, it's not funny, but he won the case against the Mont Diablo School District. So out of necessity, with the money he got, he rented a place and it started out as a coffee house and for about one year, and then it didn't turn out that well. So that's how this first started back in 59. So that's, we've been here at the store now for over 50 years, going on 51 years now. And that's what my book, um, Born on the Eighth, is about all the different experiences. I mean, all my books relate somehow to Ming Guang. Mm -hmm. Can I ask what the lawsuit was about? What? And what was the lawsuit about with the Mount Diablo School District? Excuse me. Talk a little louder, please. Sorry, my microphone is quiet. Um, what was the lawsuit uh, with the Mount Diablo School District? Oh, because he had, um, he had all kinds of materials out, like um, John Birch Society, the Black Panther, because Black Panther were real rebels in those days. And, but then he had also, and the Berkeley Barb, remember that Berkeley Barb? No, that was way before your time. But anyhow, he had that kind of material, plus all the other conservative ones. And so he had a good combination of things. And so the parents got, um, parents got upset and I guess it went to the, um, there was a lawsuit against him, but he won the case and got whatever. The, m the money that was awarded him, that's how he opened up the coffee house. So it started out as the melting pot, then it evolved into Mingguang, which was good because then there's the history of Mingguang. That's what, did I answer your question right? I think so. Was was he a teacher? What? Is he was he a teacher at the school? Yeah, he was caught. He was with um, educationally handicapped children, okay. and that's what it was called back in those days. And it's called something else nowadays. And he also taught the fifth grade, and he taught basketball and football after work. And I took care of kids too. I was a noontime supervisor. <laughs> And so I go around. You're going to the principal's office? No, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Better oh. behave. So I I took care of children, supplement the salary of a teacher, and did a budget. I was pretty good at that. Mm. And that's more or less my life. Well, that probably came in handy when you were running your own business at the store, right? The budgets what, and... What did you say? Um, the budgeting and all of that probably came in handy with uh, running your store. Oh, yeah, handy. Oh, I see. Yeah, more or less. It, it's a mess now because I had surgery on my knee about two years ago. Then I fell on a depth that was... Um, the, the screw was left up, so I walk with the limp. So everything's kind of a mess now at the store. And then you, when you were, uh, when it was the pandemic thing, you know, I, was, I wasn't there for three months and then well, going back to the store, then you got, uh, I went, I was like lethargic and the place is a mess, but people work around it. I mean, okay. I work around it and that my customers understand, don't really care. They just like the coming into the store. Mm -hmm. We've been there so long. Mm -hmm. If you ever uh, look us up on on Facebook, you'll see um, different things about some of what customers say. Mm -hmm. Did you want me to read something? Sure. 
Um, do you have a favorite passage? Well, I mean, you know, my books are kind of like long-winded. <laughs> so it's called One Pink Rose. And with, beginning with each chapter, this is this, this book. And the, what you have is the original, one of the originals. And, and, it, and it starts with the haiku. And the child asked, is my mother still living? But no one answered. So on Mother's Day, you were given a pink, no, a red rose if your mother was alive, and a white rose if your mother was dead. And so I never knew what my, if my mother was living or dying. And here's a, a, a passage. As I approached the garden, I could see a glow of colors. Blooms of brilliant red, warm pink, and startling yellow contrasted alongside the clean white roses. Each ro red, no, excuse me. Each rose, rich and full, reached out for the sun's nurturing caress. Dew glistened on each hardy bush. This section of our very garden was Miss Hayes' pride and joy. She nourished and lavished love on each bush like a doting parent. Miss Hayes was in charge of the home in Las Gatas. That's my ad lib, okay? I sense Miss Hayes would have been happier if she had been a full time gardener. Miss Hayes' tall and angular form was bent over, carefully snipping the fragrant red and white roses. The sharp clicks of her snippers were heard clearly in the morning silence. Each prize rose was laid carefully in her flat rattan basket. Standing on the perimeter of the garden was akin to being on holy ground. The gentle breeze captured the essence of her treasured roses. Its delicate bouquet lingered in the air just long enough for me to enjoy. Okay, I'll, I'll just skip some of it because I'm very descriptive. Okay. On Mother's Day, it was Miss Hayes' ritual to pin a special rose on each girl's Sunday dress. Girls whose mother was, were living wore red roses, and girls whose mother were deceased wore white roses. As usual, this was always a dem dilemma for me. On previous Mother's Day, I always worn a red rose and felt a sense of closeness to my invisible mother. So this morning before, so this Sunday morning before I asked Miss Hayes my usual question, I greeted her. Good morning, Miss Hayes. And then I asked her, you know, this is ad lib again. Um, Miss Hayes, can I wear a red rose? Because I don't know if my mother is dead or alive. And she said, I told you before, Nona. She, so I asked her, is my mother dead or alive? I told you for, before, Nona, I don't know. Did you ask your relatives? I nodded yes. She replied and replied, they don't know either. So I asked, I pleaded with Miss Hayes, can I please wear a right rose, a red rose? Miss Hayes scanned, paused and scanned her hopeful face. She then walked over to another part of the garden and she pink, picked a, a pretty pink rose pinned it to my Sunday dress and felt content. All the girls looked so festive with their own rose pins snugly in place. Lots of my thoughts I felt lucky indeed as I thought my pink rose looked almost red. When Carol walked up to me and questioned, why are you wearing a pink rose? I craned my neck to smell my rose and matter of factly quipped because I don't know if my mother is dead or alive. She looked at me wordlessly. I admired Carol's red rose and bent over to inhale the fragrance. Like it? She bubbled. Oh yeah, it smells so good. I love roses. They're my favorite flowers. Carol was lucky. Even though her mother never visited her, she at least knew her mother was alive. So that's one of my favorite passages. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, 
I, I don't know how much more time you have, but I wanted to ask uh, maybe one or two more questions. Um, how did you, I guess, how did you feel about your Chinese heritage when you were growing up? Oh, um, that's the question that you're going to be asking about if, if there was any discrimination, huh? Um, yeah. yeah, you could share if you want to. There wasn't any for me. <laughs> and that that was easy. How did I feel? I felt proud because there was this once a year parade in Los Gatos. I don't know what the what Fourth of July or Labor Day or whatever it was. Not every the whole park was filled with um, people because they were dressed as cowboys and we were always dressed in a really nice Chinese costume. And Paula and I were the little boys. And we carried this great big banner that said Ming Guang Home, I guess. That's what it said. I can't remember. And actually, I probably couldn't even read because I was just a little child. And, but we carried this banner. And so we were, I, we were proud. I mean, I was proud. But I know that other girls like um, Dolly, they got teased and they would, you know, say things against them. Like they would say, sticks and stones can break my bones, but name, names can never hurt me if they called them China, China men or something. But I didn't go through that period. Mm. So I was fortunate. I see. I don't know what I would have said. I probably would have just stared at them. And the only thing embarrassing was the fact that when we were at the park, all the food was laid out on a great big table because there's probably about 30 of us girls. And then we had to say our prayers. <laughs> so we had to bow our heads and the teacher would say our prayers and I feel all embarrassed because everybody, there was, there was silence around us and everybody would listen to the prayer that was being said at this. And so that was the embarrassing moment because mm -hmm. we were from the home and we were Chinese girls. And mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if I really felt like we were the Chinese girls. I just said that, but but that's what it would seem like to the onlookers, that these are the girls from the home and they're, they're all Chinese girls. Mm -hmm. that some of the girls thought that we were the wealthy Chinese girls that came over from China because of the war. So we were being protected by the Ming Guang home. Mm -hmm. So that was different. I found that out as an adult. Mm. Interesting. The little rich girls from Ming Guang. <laughs> I didn't realize we were little orphans <laughs> <laughs> or half orphans. Mm. See, we never called it the orphanage. It was, it, that came to me after I was being interviewed for um, Chopstick Childhood and I go, and so I looked up the word orphanage and it said, it answered all the questions. Yeah, we were really orphans and we lived in an orphanage, but the teachers at the home or Donna Dina Cameron, the one that more or less found at the home, called it Ming Guang Home. So that made it better for us girls because we always called it the home. Mm. So that was really nice of her to see the years ahead of us, how it would affect our lives. If, so it was never called an orphanage. In fact, some, but some kids, not some kids, some people wanted to come and adopt some of the girls and we all cringe and says, oh, we don't want to be adopted because we'd have to leave all our friends. Mm -hmm. So that was a good upbringing and long-term care for us Ming Guang people, girls or women. Did you know anyone who was adopted? Like, did you have friends at the home that were adopted? No, nobody. Nobody wanted to be adopted. <laughs> so I guess they paid attention to us or else, um, <laughs> No, no. Mm. It, that's amazing, huh? Yeah, that, that is. nobody wanted to be adopted. Yeah, is it? The home was that was our home. Security, always well fed. You know, just well mannered. Mm -hmm. But were there were there lots of uh, people who came to adopt? Was that common, or was it just well, sporadic? Well, we didn't really know that they were coming to be adopted that they were looking at us anyhow. Oh. And 
I don't think there were that many children that were really available because some of them still had parents. Right. And, yeah, and so, but they still come because they, they knew about the Ming Kuang home. So I guess that's what it was. Was there any, um, did you speak any Chinese? Um, was there what? Uh, did you speak any Chinese uh, with any of the other? Oh, yeah, I, I know a lot of um, Chinese Bible verses and Christmas songs. Oh. <laughs> Too okay. bad we didn't teach us how to really converse. Mm. Just um, everyday com conversation. Mm -hmm. So, but we knew what our name meant. My name means gold and silver. And I, I want it to be called a beautiful flower or lotus or something, but not gold and silver. Like, what the heck is gold and silver? <laughs> well, and then I found out from a couple that came in from Hawaii. His name was Dr. Mock. And I go, gosh, you got the same last name as me. And he says, did you know that we're from royalty? And I go, royalty? Oh, whoa. And so he, the sister sent me the genealogy, and we are from royalty. It's, it's amazing. So one of my books is going to be called From Orphan to Royalty, but I changed it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> I believe it, genea from, from the genealogy, I found out that a lot of my um, relatives moved to Hawaii, and I go, wow, because all my life, People says, are you Hawaiian? Are you from Hawaii? And I go, oh my goodness. Then I found out years later that that's where part of me is from, Hawaii. Mm. My relatives. Is that amazing what you learn in life? Oh, yeah. That's what I learned my education. My life is my education. Mm. Have you? And so when I tell a customer that Ming Guang is named after the Chinese girls' orphanage where I was raised, and it, it means radiant light. Then they'll buy an outfit or something, and I'll go, you will be the radiant light. Don't forget, you're the radiant light of Ming Guang. And they go out all happy. So it's it's nice that Donna Dina Cameron's at the foresight to not call it an orphanage. Mm -hmm. Since you know so much about your genealogy of what? I can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, since you know so much about your genealogy, have you been able to to contact any of your family in Hawaii? No, just the Malt family. The ones that came in. And then one sister already passed away, for, unfortunately, because um, there's Bingo, um, you know, no, because they're they're ancient, you know. Like, I found out that one of them was uh, on the jury duty, not jury, one of the judges, and and he and he printed a book of poems. And I go, oh my goodness, that's where I got that interest in poetry was from this relative called Mock something Mock Chai. So it's it's just um. So, you know, thousands of years ago that this genealogy thing came up. I mean, the ancestors are mm -hmm. hundreds or thousands of years ago. Right. It was during the, uh, the some kind of dynasty when mm -hmm. um, we were from royalty. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. I think I, it's in a $10,000, not $10,000, 10,000 flowers book about my genealogy. I've written mm -hmm. so many books now that I'm getting mixed up about what's in what book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, you have four books, right? How many books have you written? Four. Four. Sick Childhood, Bamboo Woman, that's like the sequel. I didn't really, I really wasn't going to write another book. And then someone says, but what happened to you? What happened? What happened? <laughs> Wanted to know, so Bamboo Woman came, and after that, then that's about 20 other stories about why the girls came to the home and what happened to them, and Bingo's in that one. And that book, Bamboo Woman, was picked for International Women's Day at St. Mary's College in Moraga. 
Then 10,000 flowers came after I found out about royalty, I guess. Yeah, because that was going to be called orphan to royalty, but it's 10,000 flowers. It's about things I've learned in life. And even if it was negative, it turned into good things. Mm -hmm. Flowers. And then born on the 8th because I, I, I'm i not into math. And then my husband was at a flea market and he found a book about numerology and I looked it up and I go, oh my gosh, in JFK and everything, they all went by their, no, they didn't, went by, they didn't go by their numbers. They vibrated to certain numbers and they were exactly how they were in life. It was just amazing. So that's, so every time I do something about um, numerology, I have them add up their words, uh, their numbers, because I want to make sure that I'm adding it right, that they're adding it right, and that I'm telling them the truth about their life path or what they came to do. So I was invited to a couple of parties for numerology, and people were amazed that numerology vibrated so well. I mean, even their names, it's their inner part of them and their outer part. And so, oh, jeepers, I lost my train of thought. I'm getting, uh, my thought is too many um, Zooming things. First, Kiwanis and now you. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to get on here. It's just like taxing for my poor brain. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I totally understand. <laughs> <laughs> and then I didn't know that I was supposed to find a passage from the book. And so I had to rush in and try to find a, a passage that I like because I, every chapter is so different. So yeah. when I was interviewed for um, East Dude Meng Guang, they wrote up about the uh, um, the right the red rose or one pink rose. So I thought, oh, I'll I'll do that one because yeah. everyone more or less can relate to a mother. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, thank you so much for sharing that and for preparing it on such short notice. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Daniel, you um, have to get, get on her a little more because if she had told me, I would have been a little more prepared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was my fault. Grace, Grace, you're really nice. Nice <laughs> person to talk to and to correspond with. Oh, thank you so much. You are too. You are low fun. You know what a low fun is now? I don't. A white person. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've learned two Chinese words today. I don't know what <laughs> Uh, All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Daniel, did you have anything else you wanted to add or anything you wanted to say? I'll, I'll write you. I'll write the Tong Yun. That's your Chinese lesson now. Chinese yeah. and Cantonese is Tong Yun. Okay, and gotcha. Lo and Lo Fan is white person. Right, or okay. Fan Yun. I can, I mean, you can say it either way. So sometimes when I, a customer comes in, I go, what was your Chinese lesson for the day? And they'll go, um, 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 I says, you're getting close. They'll go light. And I go, yeah, radiant light. Don't forget, you are a radiant light. So mm -hmm. everybody has to go out with their Chinese lesson for the day. <laughs> well, and they're my customer. <laughs> well, Nona, Nona, it's very clear that you have been a radiant light yourself to all of these people <laughs> that you've met in your lifetime. And all the store, the, the people who come to your store every day, they are blessed by your radiant light. So uh, thank, thank you, you. thank that you so nice. much. Thank you for okay, bringing your radiant light nice here. Nice to meet. Okay. Bye. Right. Bye, Nona. Right. Thank, thank you, you so much. Bye-bye. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you.